before you know or before you can detect the lie you have to know the truth if you don't know the truth you won't be able to won't be able to see the lie so you watch this Most of us will read that as the cat sat on the mat. But that's a lie. And the only way you can detect that that's a lie is by, no, by knowing the grammatical truth of that type of text. That's called a glosser. But in the Black's Law Dictionary, it's a corrupt gloss that corrupts the essence of the text which is the meaning of the text now we would assume that that would read the cat sat on the mat but in actual fact it doesn't read that at all because when this typeface is translated back to English it reads this It's only when we know the truth of that text there that we can see the lie. Because the truth of that text doesn't read what you thought it did. In Article 11147 of the Chicago Manual of Styles, it identifies this all uppercase text as American Sign Language or ASL. And when you enter into a contract, contract you have to sign yourself into it, sign the document. That's a sign, sign language. So when you enter into that document, that sign document, you have to sign your name, sign something. And the trick is in 11147 of the Chicago Manual of Styles, it shows you the truth of how to write sign language. It shows, you, it shows you the correct way to do it. So when you know the correct way to read sign or how it is meant to be, so it can be strung along into a sentence, or so two or more signs can be uh, put together in, into a sentence. The signs must be hyphenated. Because sign language follows the grammatical rules of ancient Latin and it also uses ancient Latin which is the all uppercase symbolic text to create signs so when you know the truth when you write the cat sat on the mat and you put the hyphens in between well it actually reads the whole lot it uh, strings it together into sentence. So when you know the truth, you can detect a lie. You see, we have been lied to for thousands and thousands of years, is what I assume. But especially in the last, um, since Accursius in 1230 AD, when they created the Corpus Juris, which is a, a quasi trust law system. And what they did to do that is they created two names.
might think that that's two two names there, but it's two words that um, constitutes one name. There's the other name. Sign language. So if you know the truth, you can detect the lie. So what happened in uh, 1230 when they created the surname, which means cognomen, this is a nomen. Cognomen, that's a nomen. A nomen is the power of Rome. A cognomen is the machine of Rome. So that's the power of Rome. And this is the the machine of Rome. And a machine is a is a corporation. It's also the debtor. That's the creditor. So when you know the truth you can detect the lie. So now that you know that there's two names, and these two names were created in in um, 1230 AD in the reign of, in the Hohenstaufen uh, Empire of Rome, when the Hohenstaufen um, family ruled, for, I think from 1100 to 12 something, around roughly 100 years, it was in their reign of power that they perfected a thing called the Corpus Juris that was created by Justinian around 530 to 560 and it was perfected in 1230 just after the Magna Carta in order to counteract true common law. They had to keep going the private contracts of Rome which were inside the, um, the Corpus Juris or the law of the water, law of the sea, the Holy Sea. Now, now I'm going to show you the absolute lie in trust law, and this is a um, it's this is a crime. This is a true crime. This this crime is sort of so simple but complex that uh, we don't we don't see it. We don't get it. And because we are born into this crime, birthed into it, born into it, we can't see the truth because the lie appears to be the truth because we were born into the lie. Now, trust law, which is um, it has three elements and it's usually used in um, private contracts and um, it's a, a very powerful system because if there's a contract established between two parties a third party is present present and it acts as a go-between but also acts like a witness to the agreement that was made Trust law has a creditor, a debtor, and an administrator. It's got three elements in it. The creditor gives the, or grants the dominion, the, he may own some property. Uh, and if he's, if he's the sovereign, then he will own the mineral and energy wealth of the land that we were born onto because that was a grant that was given to us in 
article uh, 126 in Genesis where God granted dominion which is the absolute authority to man over land air sea and the thing that creepeth, creepeth that is the surname the cognomen the creditor has power over all of this what the creditor does is an administrator comes along which is usually the Vatican and offers to take the dominion from the creditor from the man in order to administer it and look after it for man so that he doesn't have to worry about it but he'll take a percentage and what the administrator then does is he offers this to a debtor to pay the debts of the bills of the state so the administrator holds all these debts and he gives it to the debtor the debtor pays the bills but what the debtor is gets is trustee trustee compensation so he gets compensation the administrator gets a percent as a, an agent because he's a go-between here and as the debts are paid back the debts are paid to the creditor the creditor gets the profit creditor gets the profit gets all of his um, his estate looked after by the administrator the administrator hands it to the debtor and the, the administrator acts as the go-between that's how a trust works that's the truth now that you know the truth about the trust you should be able to detect the lie so we have the truth as a creditor, as an administrator, as a debtor. One, two, three parties makes up the trinity, the trust. One, two, three. That's the key. But what the Corpus Juris did and what uh, Justinian and Accursius and the Vatican have done and the judiciary they've devised a quasi trust it looks much the same but it, it is a quasi which is a fictitious trust a fiction trust and it operates as the office of creditor the office of administrator and the of debtor the office of administrator the office of the debtor and the office of the creditor but these offices have to be filled and in reality there are only two parties there is us and there is the administrator but the difference between the creditor, the administrator and the debtor between us, you and I have only got a choice of being either the creditor or the debtor. 
We can also become the administrator too. But once the administrator, that's the judiciary, the judges, the magistrates. Once the ju judiciary um, sign an oath or swear an oath to enter, to leave the debtor or creditor standing and become the administrator. That oath is a life oath. They are told how the system works on the condition that they never return back. And if a magistrate or a judge ever attempts to act as the creditor or ever attempts to step down here, then the magistrate will surely die. He won't last. The Vatican <laughs> will make sure he doesn't last, and rightly so. But when it comes to us, so that puts the magistrates up into the office of the administration. But what one are you? Well, if you have a look on your birth certificate, it says on the day you were born, something was birthed. And that was Smith. They say it was your surname, but it was a birth for something. And about a month later, your Christian name was then birthed. Um, born day. registration date. But you only have a choice out of those two birth certificates to hold. You can hold one or the other. This one is called the certificate of birth, which is the birthing of the Christian trust, which happens about one month after you were born. Maybe even a bit closer, I don't know. But when I was born, it was about a month. The, um, the Smith Trust is the birth certificate. So that is the certificate of birth. This is the birth certificate. The Smith is the debtor. Paul, John Paul is the creditor. But you're born into the ship of the debtors because while you're a debtor, the administrator will look after your trust to make sure that you don't destroy the, uh, the, the equity of the credit. But on the age of 21, which is the age of majority for a man, I think it's 18 for a woman, but the age of 21, you have a big party and you get the key to life. And a lot of people get this key, but a lot of people don't understand what the key's all about. Well, it's really the sister key trust. It's a key to access the creditor standing it was inside this quasi trust but if you don't take that key and you don't work out what you're doing and you maintain the name your surname Smith then you are deemed to not be the creditor you remain as the debtor after you turn 21 which leaves this three-way trust in our case as only two parties. So a trust can't work with the, if there's only two parties. It's just an agreement, but it's not trust law. But in this quasi-trust, the government sets up a, an officer of administrator, the office of creditor, and the office of debtor. And it knows that only one of these can be filled at, at one time. So what happens is that allows the trust to still work because the office of administration, the administrator, the office of the creditor 
and the office of the debtor still constitutes a three-party trust law setup. So the trust is fine, but it, it's only housed, there's only two people at home in each of these offices. This office remains empty. Now when this office remains empty, what that turns the magistrate, and this is the, the crime, because the magistrates and the judiciary and the Vatican that offered to act as the administrator, the minute the creditor is, is not there and it turns into just a two-way trust, it turns the administrator into the creditor because the creditor moves back up to here one. That becomes the creditor. He becomes just the debtor. So the debtor now, as we've paid the dominion, which is the authority, to the mineral and energy wealth. These are the mines here. It's where the, the, all the, the oil, the, the coal, the energy that we supply, billions and billions of dollars, trillions of dollars worth of oil, gas, energy and mineral wealth is owned by us, the creditors. We offer that to the Vatican for the administration. They hand it to the debtor to be, uh, for the debts of the, of, of the system to be paid for. So the debts are paid for back to here. And when the administrator goes to pay the debts to the creditor, Credit is not there. And the Vatican then becomes the creditor. So the trust is a quasi lie set up to let us believe that it's all properly working. So when we go into the court, we go in on this side, the police or the councils, they sit on that side. The magistrate sits up in the chair at the top, but by the time you walk out, what the magistrate has done, is that all he does is he establishes, are you the creditor or are you the debtor? And after, you get, after he gets your name and date of birth, he works out that you become the creditor, that you become the debtor, there is no creditor. So that means that everything that's been paid for, that you've paid your house loans, all your fines, your mortgages, um, everything that you've ever borrowed, your credit cards, everything has been paid back to the administrator who turned himself into the creditor by deceiving you into becoming the debtor. Now what happens when you come back to being the creditor, if you find your way back to being the creditor, by working out your true name and your true date of birth, and by starting to hold this side over here, then you are no longer the debtor. The debtor, the office of debtor then becomes vacant, which changes the administrator of the creditor and their debtor. Once the debtor's gone up here, it changes the magistrates, the Vatican, into the debtor. That's why the administrator and the magistrates and the police and the government are so hell-bent on you remaining dumbed down, holding the surname, because what this three-way trust does that is only housed by two parties, it, it's housed by the Vatican and us. And we make the choice, are we creditor or debtor? If we are debtor, the administrator, becomes the creditor but if we become the creditor the administrator becomes the debtor but find a debtor here down here to pay the debts so that means that he only moves up into the debtor and he must then settle all of the charges that have been clocked up by 
the debtors and by the magistrates in the Vatican. They clock the debts up, they must pay them. And that is why you have been tricked and deceived into spending all of your life as the debtor. And when you die and you get you get your name engraved, engraved under a, a, a tomb, you will have the name John Paul Smith. That is the debtor. And it's also the born date. Identify that you are the creditor. And then what the administrator does up here, the magistrate, he makes sure that that name goes on the tombstone and he uses the tombstone as the absolute confirmation that you as the debtor never return back to being the creditor because the proof is on the tombstone, the final stone, the final um, act that you did is the final act of death. You remained as John Paul Smith. You did not come back as the creditor as John Paul. The evidence is on the tombstone. That is your eternal death. So that gives the administrator the right to claim the estate of the creditor and never have to pay back. And what he's done, it's called conversion because he converted the mineral and energy wealth the dominion this is the dominion over here he, he, he converted the dominion of man and stole it and took it for the magistrates and the Vatican which is the serpent usurper which is the snake the snake in the garden and Adam was tossed from the creditor into the debtor by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge instead of the tree of life. This is the tree of life and that is the tree of death. And the way they did it, they did a two parties in there, is by creating a three-way office of creditor, office of administrator and office of debtor. Office of Creditor, Office of Administrator, the Office of Debtor. And no matter what you do, all governments are an office. You will notice that they always speak to the officer. And the only way you can, um, can uh, uh, have jurisdiction with the government is that you must hold an office or a... a um, a private name or a surname that renders you a part of this trust. This, these two names down here, this is a birth. Smith is the birthing place for the debtor and the, John Paul is the birth of the creditor. And it's what birth or what office you hold in this system that makes you either the creditor, which turns the administrator into the debtor, or if you're the debtor, it turns the administrator into the creditor so he will win and that's why he needs you to remain as mr smith remain in the um the office of the debtor in order that he can remain be in order that he can convert himself from administrator who gets just a percentage of the take into the creditor and takes his percent plus everything down here and he never ever has to return it to the creditor because the creditor has died, he's gone, you couldn't find your way back home, so you lost your estate and you lost it to the magistrates, to the Vatican and to the snake in the garden. And that's what the Adam and Eve story is all about. That is the perfect crime. It's a crime of conversion by converting 
the dominion that was granted to man in 126 over to Satan, the snake, the serpent, and the magistrates and the judges left the debtor and creditor and signed an oath with Satan, the snake. And once they're up there, they make sure that they administer all the wealth for this. And that's what's happening. That's exactly what's been happening. That's why the Vatican and the government, or the, that's why the Vatican has so much amazing wealth. And the, that's why the Vatican Bank and its corporations and the Rothschilds that are the debtors of the Vatican, um, the first debtors, are acting as the agents that are actually converting the dominion of the creditor into their pockets and leaving us as a debtor through the grammatical deceptions, sign language, sign. And they're using that the debased sign language, which is the corrupt glosser the corruption of the glosser in order to fool and trick us into falling into a quasi trust, a quasi three way trust, which means a copy of a real trust, but it only can have two parties, is which destroys the essence of the trust. It must have three parties, but it can't because we can only be the creditor or the debtor. It's a choice. That choice was established in the Garden of Eden with God when he said to Adam, uh, if you eat from the tree of knowledge, the tree of dead, you will surely die. So there's no one, one or the other. There's no one and the other. It is just one or the other. That's the perfect crime. I think it's the only crime that's really been, we've been warned about in the Bible. We were warned about this crime here. God warned Adam not to fall for the tree of the debtor or you will surely die. That's the perfect crime. <laughs> I don't blame you if you can't work it out because you were never meant to work it out. And I think that, um, I think that Satan's time has come. But even if it hasn't come for this planet and no one works it out, if you work it out, then that's the end of Satan. That's the end of the, um, the, administra the administrator acting as the creditor. He falls back into where he should be, back into the debtor, because that's where he started out as. And it was only through his trickery, trickery and deceit that he changed or converted himself from being the debtor into the creditor. But when you're awake up to it, um, <laughs> when you can see the truth, then you will be able to see the fiction or the lie. That's when you see, it's when you know the truth, you will see the lie.